call to order our Board of Trustees a meeting and appreciate everyone being here. It looks like we do have a quorum, so we want to welcome everyone to this meeting. A conflict of interest policy. This is an opportunity for each member to disclose uh, potential conflicts and their uh, belief that they can be unbiased and able to participate or that they elect to recuse themselves from the matter. Our mission statement is printed. Uh, as always, we have our public comment at the beginning of our meeting. Guests who wish uh, to speak must be in person, sign up for public comment. Ms. Lester, do we have public comments? Yes, sir. We okay. Have All right. We have two public comments. Uh, Jennifer South Paul, uh, you're recognized, and then uh, Mason from SEIU. Yes. Yes. Thank you. I'm Jeanette Southball, the Executive Vice President and Provost at Meharry Medical College. And as many of you know, Meharry has, is an institution whose motto is worship of God through service to mankind, a motto that anchors everything we do, including our collaboration with Nashville General Hospital. I wanted to come today to discuss that relationship considering the Nashville General, General Hospital is our index hospital, uh, a, a term that supports a learning environment that is established by liaison committee and medical education standards that set the quality of not only the environment for patient care, but for learning at, for both tres, residents and students. NGH leadership has reported a number of things to the hospital authority board and finance committee regarding the relationship between the hospital and Meharry that are not supported in fact or and or are incomplete. Any reduction in services by Meharry has been done in response to a lack of hospital support for infrastructure and nursing staff to provide quality care. NGH has failed to attend multiple mutually scheduled meetings to resolve these issues. NGH has hired clinicians independently and without consultation with Meharry. These hires either were the result of NGH aggressively recruiting Meharry faculty and then hiring them at a higher salary or refusing to pay Meharry for their services according to agreed PSA guidelines. In some cases, NGH hired independent physicians who refused to teach students or residents or who possessed inadequate credentials to qualify for faculty appointments. NGH has built CMS through the state for resident services and then refused to pay Meharry for these same residents at the current rate. NGH has canceled key contracts with Meharry and or Vanderbilt specialists, sometimes hiring others with limited scope of practice credentials, thereby compromising our ability to maintain residency faculty and training requirements. Each time NGH contracts for these providers and cuts Meharry out of the process, the, in, the hospital is in direct violation of the PSA, to which it asserts it is compliant. These actions reflect a diminished level of commitment by Meharry to the medical school, by NGH to the medical school than we have experienced in the decades since we first began working together. While refusing to pay funds owed to Meharry, NGH has diverted dollars to establish off-site practices that cater to commercially insured patients, leaving only the uninsured for Meharry to care for. This leaves Meharry to absorb majority of the losses associated with this care. This is not the model for municipal support of a city hospital, and in effect is creating a segregation of care that will promote and extend health disparities in our community. NGH has also begun to establish a parallel research enterprise with attendant new hires at additional costs, while an excellent one already exists at Meharry, at Vanderbilt, and at the Meharry-Vanderbilt Alliance, while again failing to compensate Meharry, according to the PSA. All of these actions clearly violate the PSA. Equally concerning, they are obscured in the reports presented to the Hospital Authority Board, which seem designed to discredit Meharry with no basis in fact. Such actions can harm the delivery of care and hurt our academic enterprise moving forward. My findings regarding this situation and comments today are based upon my experiences at four other medical schools spanning more than 40 years in academic medicine where I have helped negotiate many successful partnerships. I have significant expertise working within models that work and believe that for the good of the patients we all serve, Meharry Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee deserve such a bottle. Thank you. We will now hear from Mason with SEIU. <coughs> Not in public comment. Yes, you're, you're recognized. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, just 
the, a question at this point. Um, will we have an opportunity during the course of the meeting under new business to discuss what we just heard? No, sir. Is it it's possible? Not, it's not an sorry. agenda item. We can look at it as an agenda item. At may, may I ask if it's also relevant or appropriate <clears throat> even to have, it appeared that the representative had written remarks so that we can kind of, I mean, she just ran through them fairly quickly to take a look at them and have them on the record. Okay, just um, by matter of proper order, while that statement was permitted, public comment is reserved only for order for items that are for approval. And so that item was brought up um, and has no place on the agenda. It's not an agenda item. Mr. Chairman, we, we have a, a strong relationship with Meharry. It's our primary partnership, and I think we need to find a more appropriate way for them to interact with the board than to give them a three-minute opportunity in which there can be no discussion. So I'm recommending that we do something to allow them to have some place in our agenda uh, on a regular basis. So we we have, you know, sunshine and sunset laws that we have to adhere to, uh, especially as it relates to uh, doing business in, in the public setting. And so I received an email and a call a few days ago about Meharry wanting to present to this, to this uh, board. We can't add them to the agenda within a seven day period. So it's not up for discussion at this meeting, but I'll certainly entertain adding uh, them to the agenda for a future meeting. I do wanna say that we are in partnership and a legal agreement with them. And so some of those things strategically need to be discussed because, um, because again, we could be looking at lit litigation on either side. So some of those things need to be discussed as partners in a strategy session because of some of the legalities associated with that. But I would certainly entertain an opportunity to add uh, to, the, to, a, to a future board meeting for further discussion as an agenda item. Mr. Chairman, could we have a closed strategy session that included representation Ab to discuss this? Yes, absolutely. And I, I'm, it's, I believe we have a closed session today. I don't know what the agenda is. But if this is part of it, um, could uh, Dr. Southpaw be invited? It, we, it, it could possibly be part of it, but I'll need to check with counsel to make sure that we... Uh, okay. My understanding is you have an agenda item to have a motion to approve going into a, a session on strategic planning and marketing strategies. This is not the same thing. Um, and therefore, I wouldn't recommend, I will not attend that as an attorney if it's for that purpose. So, Mr. Chairman, then how can we get some advice either from counsel or from you or from somebody as to how we can approach this in appropriate way. I think what he's saying is that it's not appropriate today. Okay, how do we put it on the next agenda in an appropriate and efficient manner? And we don't have to have a motion or anything like that at this stage. No, okay. It's included on an agenda for discussion or action. It can be a 
Okay. Thank you. So um, it, it can be on the agenda of the regular meeting, or if this is clearly a strategic, could also be a part of a closed meeting. Yes. Thank you. And, and again, I'm willing to add this to our agenda. I just wanted to make sure we were, we were in the bounds of the sunshine and sun, sunset. So the whole idea is that uh, the public has an opportunity to know what we're discussing prior to, the, to that meeting. <coughs> All right. I think we're now ready to hear Mr. Mason with SEIU. You recognize? Uh, Mason Caples uh, from SEIU. I'm calling to formally invite you all to attend the town hall meeting hosted by SEIU Local 205 at the Hatley uh, Community Center. It'll be April 14th at 3 o'clock. The uh, address is 1037 28th Avenue North, Nashville, Tennessee, 37208. And we're inviting the entire community to come out and discuss um, a town hall about Nashville General and um, how we can all work together to make the new hospital a great hospital for the entire community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cables, and thank you for your service here at the hospital. Can we hear what SCIU? Ms. Cable, we have a question for you. Can you tell us about SCIU? Yes, sir. Uh, SCIU is the local union, so uh, we uh, partner with uh, all of the SCIU members for uh, Nashville Hospital Authority, Nashville General uh, Workers. Uh, we work to try to do our best to make uh, a better place for the entire community, put forth our work uh, and our professional oath, and do what's best for the entire Nashville. And that's what the local SEIU 205 uh, seeks to do. Thank you. Service Employees International Union. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, we're now back on our agenda for, um, we have our uh, minutes, and you all have had an opportunity to review those. Any questions or discussion? If not, I'll entertain an adoption to approve. Move approval. Second. Move and properly second. All in favor, vote by the sign of aye. All opposed, ayes have it. Minutes have been adopted. Old business revenue discussions. Uh, uh, Bruce. I'm going to be very brief, Mr. Chair. I believe Dr. Brown could probably give you a fuller update, but uh, my role, we've been working, as you know, with the forensics um, out at Centurion for a good bit of time. And actually, we're, um, we've got uh, rates in place for physicians to attend at uh, the DeBerry facility. What we're working on right now is telehealth opportunities um, with multiple uh, specialties and uh, primary cares in the hospital. And so we're getting that set up similar to what we have in the other on-site. And it, that way it would allow for follow-up if they go out to DeBerry and then they need a follow-up visit or a check visit. And that's what we've been working on. And we're, we're real close. I don't know if Mark wants to comment. Mr. Chair, uh, last week we actually met with one of the vice presidents of Centurion. I think they just sold, uh, uh, purchased it from Centene. So they were on site. And so what we're uh, attempting to do is, like uh, Mr. Nermore said, uh, increase our telehealth. We've already established uh, times uh, for our providers to go out to uh, DeBerry. Uh, and we've been working with Core Civic as well. So. We're moving in the direction of a forensic service line uh, for someone to lead that uh, service line so that way we can streamline uh, their needs. And then the next um, adventure would be to actually um, partner with uh, Centurion for on-site uh, different procedures that need to be done out there. So that way they, because they're uh, experiencing transportation issues. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Ms. Poole, you recognize hospital utilization. Good 
afternoon, everyone. So for the Metro Healthcare Incentive Program, we had a great opportunity earlier this month. The Metro Action Commission has about 300 employees and we had a team of employees. I believe Mason was one of the ones who were out there. Um, go to their event. They were able to do biometric screenings for them. I believe they did like over 160 of them that day. And then members of our team were actually a part of panel discussions with the uh, members of Metro Action Commission talking about the Metro Incentive Program, as well as emergency room services here, trauma services, and women's health. So currently right now, system-wide, our Metro employees make up five, and their dependents make up 5.5% um, of the, our volume for the NHC, it increases to about 6.2%. Um, of those Metro employees and dependents who come here, about 50% of them utilize the Nashville Healthcare Center, 25% utilize ancillary services here, and there's about 13% who utilize our emergency department. So, thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Ms. Poole. Okay. Dr. Webb, we recognized for relocation updates. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the update is we've uh, had discussion with the mayor and his team regarding uh, putting together a uh, committee that would review site selection. Uh, the board chair and I have met and had that discussion. We're still waiting on dates to be established for, for the uh, first meeting. Thank you. Attorney Brown, you're recognized to give us an update on the CEO performance review. Good afternoon. So the committee met um, to go over the performance evaluations for um, for next year, and we realized that we needed a little bit more time, maybe another week or two, to kind of review the current draft, follow up with HR and legal, make sure that the word smithing is right um, before we bring it back to you all to review um, and hopefully pass out. So we'll have another update at the next meeting. Thank you. All right. Um, so we have the CEO performance review uh, committee report scheduled as new business, but I believe we're going to roll that until um, our next uh, scheduled um, board meeting. Is that correct? Okay, good. Uh, Ms. Poole, you recognize again for marketing report? Hello again. Um, this is kind of just an overview of our marketing initiatives over the last couple of months. I do want to welcome Ms. Misha Maynard, who is President of Community Health Marketing, um, who is with us today. And just kind of an overview of the team members, just so you understand how we are split up between the hospital marketing team as well as members from Community Health Marketing. Um, and the various roles. We have had a planning session yesterday. So you will, at the next board meeting, we'll have a scorecard for our KPIs within marketing, communications, with um, public relations, government affairs, as well as new patient referrals, provider referrals, Metro incentive. Um, we'll be launching a new external newsletter, as well as all the social media. Um, information as well. And then we will do a larger quarterly presentation to the board where you get to see everything kind of put together. So just as an update, we've got two um, press releases that'll be coming out next week. One is on the Hope Meds program. This is with the Dispensary of Hope. It's been at Nashville General for about a year. Um, our pharmacy division has done an exceptional job with this. We've seen 1,200 unique patients. 4,700 prescriptions, about 8,400 months of free medications with a total savings of $585,000 to our patients through this program. Next, we are gonna have another um, press release about the Metro Healthcare Incentive Program. 
um, based on 2023 numbers, we've had more than 1,600 Metro employees, family members, and dependents utilize the incentive program, which equated to 6,000 visits. And the savings for 2023 alone is at more than $600,000. Since the program's inception in 2019, Metro employees have saved an estimated $3.9 million in co-pays and deductibles while having access to quality health care here at Nashville General Hospital. Um, for government affairs, both federal, or not both, we have federal, state, and local um, information listed. There was the Tennessee Hospital Association conference um, on the Hill. Dr. Webb was able to meet with the majority of the Davidson County delegation, as well as some members of Shelby County. Um, also working through the America's Essential Hospitals Government Affairs Division, where they're trying to pass national legislation to de make a designation for essential hospitals, such as Nashville General Hospital. And then at the local level, we actually I see one Metro Council person here. Thank you, Council Member Webb. Um, we've been meeting with the new council. There was a big flip in the elections this year, having them get to know who we are as their public hospital. And then, of course, Dr. Webb and Chairman Stevenson met with the mayor earlier this month as well. Um, we also want to get out there and have speaking engagements and podcast engagements. Um, the thought leadership, so the more we can elevate members of our executive leadership team, the more they follow the hospital as well. So um, Dr. Webb actually presented at a Social Determinants of Health and Equity Conference just this week. He has a Becker's Conference coming up and then another podcast. We've got Dr. Williams scheduled later this year, as well as Dr. Blackledge has been at um, some events. A whole list of things in the news. And then for community outreach, these are just places that we have been out in the community or been a part of their events. Uh, Matters of the Heart, which was a Delta Sigma Theta health event on March 2nd, because we do have our Woman of Impact for 2024, Ms. Kaylin Harris. Um, again, the Metro Action Commission, we will be hosting two huge health events next weekend, Saturday and Sunday. It's a huge lift for our clinical team and um, it will be at Mount Gilead on Saturday and then on Sunday at Riverside. And then we also will be hosting the CEO Summit for the Governor's Faith-Based Initiative on April 10th. We participate in Wine, Women and Shoes. Any of our female board members who would like to attend, please let me know, we have room at the table. And then, um, of course, we learned about the SEIU event, so that is April 14th, and then the Go Red Luncheon on April 18th. And next, I did, this is a presentation, Kaylin, I've been trying to get her in front of the board, but we've, you know, had other conversations for marketing, just so you can get a feel for what we do as far as reputation management and digital reviews. So, Ms. Harris. Thank you, Kathy. Good night, afternoon, everyone. For those of you I have not had the privilege, uh, privilege, Lord, of meeting, my name is Kaylin Harris. I'm the manager of marketing communications here for Nashville General Hospital and Nashville Healthcare Center. And in my roles and responsibilities, part of my role is to manage our digital marketing efforts, specifically our online brand reputation management. So for those of you who have had the opportunity to use some of our ancillary services or come through our hospital at some point in time, Anytime you leave a review for one of our facilities, I am the individual that responds to that review and whether positive or negatively, I respond to every review that's sent in through the hospital. So today, I would like to go through some of the commentary that we've received, but then also go through how our online brand reputation and management has changed over the last year. So we can go forward. Oh, we, oh thank you. 
So back in 2022, we realized as an internal marketing team that our online brand reputation and the image that we were putting out online needed some work and needed some help desperately. So for many of you, for perfect example, anytime when you go out of town, you're going on vacation, the first thing you do is research restaurants to try. You research hotels to stay in. And you, we all look at the star rating and we also look at how many reviews have been left online. We know that that's a quick go-to, not just for our patient population, but the general public and different demographics. So if you were to Google Nashville Healthcare Center or Nashville General Hospital, you will see one Google business profile for Nashville Healthcare Center Midtown and one also for main campus. Since Bordeaux just opened and Metro Center is growing as well, we will set up Google My Business accounts for those profiles. And then you will also see one for Nashville General Hospital. But specifically, I will talk about Nashville Healthcare Center today and those ratings. So these are the profiles that you will see online. So the data that you see before you reflects January 1st through December 31st of 2023. So just to kind of give you a snapshot of where we started, especially for those of you on that back wall who can't see these numbers, in 2012, amongst National Healthcare Center, there was only one review left for the entire year of 2012. And I know that we have a lot of providers and a lot of clinicians in the room we saw more than one patient in 2012. However, only one person decided to go online and leave a review. If we jump forward to 2019, we had 57 reviews. Essentially, that's one review a week from our patient population. So again, in 2022, Kathy and myself, we sat down and we started working with an, an outside vendor patient point um, to determine how can we increase our utilization of those profiles online and increase our social digital social standing. So from 2022, we had a 3.19 star rating on Google and only 32 reviews. So I'm very proud and honored to share in 2023, since starting that relationship, we had four point we have a 4.83 star rating and 1,142 reviews that have been left amongst all of our National Healthcare Center profiles. Click forward. So the data that you see before you, so you come in, let's say you're coming in to speak to a primary care provider. You have your appointment, you get discharged. Within a 24-hour to 48-hour window of time, you will receive either a text message or an email to your phone. Whether you had a positive experience or negative experience with your provider, you will receive an email or a text message prompting you to leave a review. So at the time that that message is received by you, you will either click that you want your review to be public, which which means it will land on health grades, Facebook, or Google, or it can be private, which you would just text back the number that you got that message from. So in the last year, we've sent out, there have been over 8,000 invitations sent out. There has been a 33% click-through rate by our patient population and 11% of that 8,000 plus left reviews. So public reviews over the past year were 875. So again, public reviews, meaning Facebook, health group rates, or Google, public facing reviews. And from those 875, we had a 4.87 star rating. And then all time public reviews, a little bit over 1,000 with a score rating of 4.59. So if the rating breakdown in the bottom corner, again, whether a patient has a positive or a negative experience, they receive the same exact message to their phone. So we don't try to skew the numbers that we only send this out to patients that said to the um, medical receptionist that they had a great experience with their provider. It goes out to everyone. But 982 patients rated their experience five star. There were only 22 one star reviews over the entire year, six two stars, five three stars, and 44 four stars. And again, um, from text messages, there were, I think, close to a little bit over 7,500 text messages that were sent. And then just depending on how the patient prefers to be communicated with, they received an email. Next slide. And then so we decided, we started out with the um, National General Hospital provider. So our next iteration of this, as we grow and we work, <clears throat> excuse me, to add more providers. But well, we started first with the providers that we knew that had really not only just good relationships with their patients, but then also some new providers that have come under our umbrella of leadership as well. 
So the, right here, you'll see the highest rated and the lowest rated providers. So a lowest rated provider does not necessarily mean they receive all of the one stars for that calendar year. It just simply means that provider may have gotten an average of four star reviews over 30 reviews that were submitted. However, a highest rated provider may have received 33 reviews and they were all five stars. Um, so a plethora of doctors are listed here for, for your view. And they, again, they span through orthopedic surgery. We have some primary care providers that are listed as well, our ENT specialists, and a couple of others. Click forward. And then last but not least, the data I'm also able to see amongst all of those reviews that were sent in over a calendar year, I'm able to see what did our patient population, if they sent in a five-star review, what did they consider to be on the lower spectrum that we need to work on? So typically, a lot of the reviews that I see, a lot of the information that comes in, wait time is a huge thing for our patients when they come in to see one of their care providers, but we always get high ratings when it comes to the doctors, the staff, the communication, as well as the services that are being provided to them. And then you can click. Thank you. Are there any questions? <laughs> oh, okay. I see you recognizing that, Dr. Martin. Yes, of those roughly 1,000 reviews, how many are from inpatient experiences and how many from outpatient experiences? So the data that I just showed you is all um, outpatient experiences. This is not reflect inpatient. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, the, Kathy. The reason for that um, is we still have two EMRs until we have Oracle Cerner Health come in. And so with the work going on in IT, it was easier for us to only use ECW, and they're able to pull directly from those appointments, which is why it's on the Nashville Healthcare Center side. When we get Cerner implemented, we'll be able to pull from all areas of the hospital, emergency room, inpatient, as well as um, ambulatory. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, two questions. One, uh, is this information shared with the doctors, both the high numbers and the low numbers? Yes. And then what happens? So yes, this information is shared with the doctors. Some, I believe majority of the doctors have, um, what's the word? They have approved for this inf a report card to be sent to them. So the doctors are able to see every individual review that has been left and the commentary that was left as well as the star rating. So we have those providers set up through there. And then this information, we do share this information out with the providers. And then if a doctor has received a one star, two star, or three star review, we now have a new director of patient experience and that information is shared with her. And I also sit on the voice of the customer committee as well. So I share the same data with them during that meeting. But what is done, so that is a further question as far as the how they handle that process and what's done as far as correction or improvement. But this information is shared even with our directors. I've had, I've presented this to a couple of different groups. <laughs> So um, as Caitlin mentioned, the voice of the customer committee with having such a new patient experience director, that is um, kind of the next step because we get information from these digital reviews. We get it from Press Ganey, the HCAPs. So it's all bringing it together so that that team can go through and it's representatives who are part of the ambulatory section that I think Tim and Sharon might be on there because they handle the diagnostic imaging and rehab services. So everybody nursing has a piece of the pie so that then they're really able to look at and see the trends. Is it just one area that needs a little more customer service work or other issues. So um, that's a big part of our Baldrige journey when we talk about the voice of the customer and identifying all the different areas where we receive feedback. And then as it relates to the comments that come back, uh, do we celebrate the good ones as well as go after the bad ones? Definitely. So as far as um, we have the RL data system, so if there's any negative reviews, it immediately goes into that system for it to be tracked and for the work to be done to figure out what happened. And then Tori's very good at following up with the patient as well as the division in which the incident may or may not have occurred. And then as the doctors, I will say we have some doctors that are a little bit more engaged with their Google My Business. Um, Dr. Long, I, will, I can see everything kind of coming through and she will connect with her patients directly. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's um, 
presented to the director's meeting and then it can be distributed that way. And one of the things with that voice of the customer committee that's gonna be important is when we do the um, medical staff newsletters is being able to share that and have a little friendly competition go in there. And then, oh, I'll say with the positive. I would say, and then even the positive, Tori, our new director of patient experience, she is really good about sharing out the positive as well when it comes to the providers. That's been a huge <laughs> tactic that she's trying in her role and in, in, in her leadership is making sure that all employees are aware of the information that's coming in so we don't just focus on the negative when it comes to our brand reputation. Um, thank you for sharing this. So I don't have great vision and was unable to see where you had the four stars and the rankings of the, did everyone get fours? Did people get twos? Mm -hmm. um, so if there's a way to share that, that would be super helpful. Also, is this another tool in the toolbox to evaluate providers, staff, things of that nature? And there's like one holistic conversation with the doctor to say, oh, this is what we got from the Google reviews. This is what we got from the others. Or is this just something that you're looking at? I don't know if I asked the question right, but how is this used in real life? So, well, I guess it goes back to the voice of the customer committee. So when we meet up in that conversation, everything's pulled in to figure out, okay, where are our where are the points of correction? Where are the points that we as an internal team can correct wait time? If that similarly comes up between HCAPs, patient point, and any other, and even on social media, anyone comments, where are the patient, where are the points where we can fix and correct for our patient population? But this, again, this information is shared out. The, all providers that are listed in our database have access to this information as well. And then Kathy? So as you're talking about um, for the providers, a lot of times um, I believe they're using mainly the HCAP scores mm -hmm. for that as far as physician evaluations. Um, it, and I think this is a good place to, to make sure the dots are being connected from voice of the customer to all areas, whether it's employee um, information or physician. Side. Okay. And this is just for the clinics. We don't do this for the hospital right now. Right. Yeah not until we get CERN. That's, so it's just that small group of doctors who are part of the ECW patient. We have two patient portals. So people on the ECW patient portal, which is just through the clinics, is who we focused on. Because of um, there's too much connection with IT to try and get two more or one more um, patient portal connected to the program. And we really just kind of wanted to see how it did before we went hospital wide. So we have not used any public facing tool to get feedback on this hospital until you all set this up. Like we just haven't gotten anything. We, we, we get them. Um, we, we just didn't have a base for everything to collect all of Like anytime somebody had a review, Mainly, if it was through Facebook or any other social media, we handled it the same way. You know, we're sorry you had this or thank you for, but it wasn't consolidated in this manner. So we've really put a focus on that physician reputation piece of it. Because the ultimate goal is when you go to our website, I want you to be able to see what people's star ratings are. Right. How often are you pulling this information? Is this something you can share at every board meeting? This is what we found. Um, mm -hmm. Or is this... No, we can do it monthly. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Kathy, so keeping it simple, when do you anticipate we will have the ability to do that for this hospital? Um, once we get Cerner launched. That's a... Give somebody, us a time frame. Uh, that's an IT. <laughs> <laughs> and your representative from IT? Yeah. Be end of the year. End of the year. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And then we can, um, one of the things we can work on is just making sure if there's, um, because like you said, it's hard to read this information. I did this um, for Finance Chair Smith where I put a um, SharePoint site and kind of gave her access to it. And then she's able to look at all the documents in there and we can do the same thing. I can upload this to a site and make sure you guys have um, access to that site. In a perfect world, what would you want us to, to do with this information? Are we using it for CEO evaluation, hospital? What What is your vision with this? Um, with 
the vision for me is to make sure it gets out there enough so that more people will want to come and change the perception of Nashville General Hospital. But yes, I think it can definitely be used for evaluations, whether at an employee level, physician level. Well, I mean, it has to. Otherwise, right. what's the point of having it if we don't do something with Correct. it? Correct. Correct. It helps us become better. Yeah. Any more questions or comments? Great. I'm sorry. I, I do, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Going back to government affairs, Kathy. Yes, sir. Can we talk about that for a minute? Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll bundle my question for two or three of these items. What's listed here is met with Tennessee delegation to discuss NGH, uh, solicited support, met with each state Senate and state house delegate of Davidson County, met with each newly elected Metro council person. What kind of reaction are we getting? What have they committed to? What, what are the kinds of things that they're saying are important to them? And, to, uh, and, and that they will support substantial comment that can be used to advance our programs and initiatives. And then my comment, and, and I, I, I look forward to your answer on that, but my comment also is my experience in government affairs suggests that elected officials like to see unity when the organization and its board are in, uni in unified fashion. And I would hope that at some point, certainly respecting all of the limitations we have on more than one of us or two people getting together at one time, uh, that a board member from time to time can be invi invited to these sessions so that the elected officials understand there is support from the board, that it's not just the CEO with all due respect, but that, that there is also support from the board moving forward to uh, move ahead on whatever the initiative is. I, I, think it's, I think it's more appropriate and I think it will be welcomed and I think the response will be more positive and we can act on those responses. Um, yes, ma'am. Well, no, I was gonna say, I've been in some of the, I've been in the council meetings, so local ones where they, come in and they're able to meet with the executive team, much like a board onboarding, how when each of you became board members, you met with Dr. Webb and then you came and met with the executive team. So as new council people, we felt it was very important. Um, but as far as the federal and state levels, I'm going to have to flip that over to Dr. Webb. We will certainly make it a point to uh check with uh, board members and give you advance notice of when we'll be having, uh, for instance, the uh, on the Hill meetings. And uh, I would be delighted to be accompanied by, uh, I guess it would just have to be one at a time, but certainly whoever's available, uh, be happy to, uh, to do that. I was just going to ask about metrics um, when we meet with our elected officials. Um, and I think that might help with some of the transparency if all of us aren't able to attend. What is our agenda when we go in? Because we can say a meeting went well, and that's perspective. But are we getting feedback from the legislators and we're funneling that back to the board and the administration? Um, are we giving them a little palm card with fun facts? Like what are we, what is our engagement with them like? Um, and I think just more detail with that because I feel like as we get closer to budget, um, there's always surprise information that we learn from our electeds they have concerns with and I don't believe those pop up one time a year, I think it's a constant conversation. And so I just think if you all could have three or four bullet points with these meetings of what you want to highlight and how you could report that back, I think that would be helpful as well. Definitely. We will add that to the scorecard. I know for the council um, meetings that I make sure to print out kind of um, the demographics of the hospital because a lot of councilmen might not realize that we actually have patients from their district or the amount of patients from their district. Everyone seems to think this is just a hospital for this side of town. So I think it is shocking when somebody from Southeast is like, oh, they're number two 
and then somebody from up north is actually number three, that Madison area. So um, we always like to present that information as well. But yes, to your point, we can do like a quick handout, have our top items, and then um, I know when Dr. Webb has met with them, he can come back and add, he's added that in his CEO report, but we can do a more formal um, report out during, um, as part of our KPIs. And the last thing, and I promise I'm done, um, it would also be really good to, um, oh my gosh, the thought just popped out of my head. Oh, also to see if we can get some kind of commitment for them to come visit the hospital, but also maybe get a flu shot or if they have the sniffles, just some kind of commitment or engagement consistently to get them in, because I think that's key Definitely. to getting their support. We had um, Congressman Green and then Congressman Rose in last year, and actually just this week had heard that Congressman um, Green is going to be in town for the Easter break, so Doctor's Day is actually this Saturday, but we're hosting an event here on Thursday next week and have him be a part of that event as well. So we always try and get those photos, make sure it's hit in social media, tagging them as well as the hospital in it and um, have that full circle moment with them. Miss, Mr. Chairman, just one more question. Yeah, absolutely. So council at an event that Kathy just described, if say three members were at that members of the board were at that session which is a session in which there will be a number of people and it's not a specific session to meet with the member of congress or the other elected officials that might be there is that inappropriate for say four members of the board to be there We need two podiums. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I'm not saying that it is or isn't. It depends. <laughs> as long as you do not discuss board bi business and you happen to be at a meeting where other board members are at, I don't believe that that would be a violation of the Open Meetings Act. Um, but you do not need to deliberate or discuss between the board members. If you're at a massive gathering and your discussions are directed towards other government officials or members of the public, that's a, that, those are okay communications, but you must wall yourselves off from one another. At the airport authority, just my experience was we had plenty of kickoff events. I mean, for instance, you know, that would say that I could come to a table, but Michelle could not. And we have plenty of kickoff events, plenty of ribbon cuttings where basically the whole board showed up. So I know that there's a way um, to get this done and to be in the room present supporting National General together. Um, but I, I do understand the, the, the fine line, but I, I just want to make sure that we feel comfortable as a board showing up to support together. And I think that is absolutely fine based on my understanding of law. Green. 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 It is. Oh, it's not up at tall. Top. It's not. That's okay. <laughs> All right. But again, uh, yes, there's the ability to attend those those functions, but again, uh, you must wall yourselves off. I also would recommend when you all come back to the next board meeting, you make reference that as a disclosure that you attended a function, you did not discuss any board business, and that uh, uh, that should take care of it. You got more questions for me? I, I lied. I'm so sorry. Um, I am very concerned about the chilling effect of having community members serve on a public board and want to come support the hospital at an event and been basically kind of told we can't engage. I don't think 
I understand the law is applied, but I am just very concerned about legal guidance because it almost sounds like you're saying don't come, but how are we supporting the hospital or is it just through coming to these meetings? I guess that's what I'm not clear on because we obviously want to jump in and support and help the hospital be amazing and advocate for it and participate in all these conversations, but our hands are limited and we're not really given a workaround. That's probably more of a vent than a question for you, but it just I just feel like our hands are tied um, as board members and yeah. Yeah, again, the legal advice is if you attend a function where more than one of you are gathered, you disclose it at the next time you meet publicly and explain that no business of this board was conducted. In other words, you didn't engage and deliberate of coming out of this event, we're going to act this way or we're going to do this. Not saying you can't attend those functions, but I do have to also, as a lawyer, uh, advise you and inform you that the Open Meetings Act is pretty clear. What it does prohibit is a meeting not open to the public where you do deliberate or discuss towards a decision. So you must not engage in any conduct like that. I'm not at all suggesting you can't go to a ribbon cutting. That would be a clear example of a site visit. Uh, hi. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to make a comment on that. Uh, and that is over the years, uh, I know the foundation has always had multiple events uh, over the year where board members have attended. And I don't think it's ever been any problem. I mean, they used to have breakfasts and activities in the community. And several board members always were there. We weren't conducting any board business, but we were there to support the foundation. So I think we're talking about two different things here, because yeah. this is really pretty, pretty simple. Yeah. Board members can be in the same room at events as long as we're not conducting business. What Mr. Lester was asking about was multiple board members going together to promote an agenda for the hospital to meet with legislators. Then we would at that point be handling that's that's different. So those are two different things. If we're just talking about showing up for a ribbon cutting or, or, or those kind of things and we're not conducting business, I think a council is saying that's appropriate. Um, if we were going to be meeting with city council members and there's going to be two or three of us and we're going to be talking about agenda items and things we want to see happen, that gets a little bit more sticky. So yeah, um, in that instance, it should just be one at a time. Yeah. So thank you, council. Let me say you all have done a great job with your marketing and, and presenting this information. Uh, the digital footprint that you're going after is so important. I review everything. I leave full reviews when I get out of an Uber, like a whole two paragraph about, you know, how comfortable the seats were and all that. So that's, that's the world we're in, where people want to know what your experience was before they have that experience. And so... Thank you for uh, creating um, and expanding that in a year's time. So if no, no other questions, we appreciate your report. Thank you. Thank you for the time. All right. Um, quality report. I think Dr. Williams is going to present that today. It's my understanding that the quality report is in the packet for the board to review, and I'm here to answer any questions along with Dr. Hudson. Unfortunately, Dr. Hudson has a recurring conflict with our quality management meeting, which is our hospital meeting. We're trying to reschedule that so it's convenient for her schedule, but the other alternative would be to have another board member who's available at that time. And we can talk about that offline, uh, Mr. Chairman, but our, our first tact is to see if we can change it to accommodate her schedule. So I'm available for any questions on the quality report? All right, you have the quality report in your packet. We received it before this meeting. If there's no questions, then I'll entertain a motion to approve it. <coughs> Move approval. Been moved, can I get a second? second. Been moved and properly second. All in favor, vote by the sign of aye. aye. All opposed, ayes have it. The quality report is, is adopted. Now our medical staff reports. Again, Dr. Williams, you're recognized. Dr. Williams, Dr. Burley for a medical, for a March credentials report. 
Yes, unfortunately, um, I had a medical emergency during the last MEC meeting where I was going to present the follow-up to uh, move the bylaws forward, so I do not have a report at this time, but we will follow up next month to get um, a recommendation from the MEC to bring forward to the board. Thank you. Dr. Burley, you're recognized. We only have a, a few appointments to deal with uh, uh, this time. Uh, Dr. Nizaru uh, is back. I believe that's Dr. Nizaru who was here previously. Uh, he's here for an initial appointment and to get temporary privileges uh, until he can uh, uh, progress further. Also, Dr. Nguyen in obstetrics and gynecology uh, has also been recommended for temporary privileges. Uh, we have a couple of the SPP uh, reappointments. One is uh, with surgery, and it's uh, uh, Miss uh, Leanne Marie Thomas with surgery, and uh, family nurse practitioner Megan Adams uh, with emergency medicine. And the recommendation was for these to go through with the recommended appointments. And there was a note, too, about uh, Dr. Bean. Uh, it's going to be covering uh, some of the activities for the med exec committee uh, for Dr. Okafor for a while. That doesn't need to be approved, but just an uh, FYI. So we would need a motion for those approvals. All right, it's been moved. Can I get a second? Second. Dr. Burley, she was asking who made the motion. Oh, I guess I made the motion. All in favor, vote by sign of aye. 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 All opposed. All right, we adopt our credentials report. Uh, Bruce, you and uh, Ms. Smith are recognized for our financial report. We begin with the... Uh, Let's start with the audit report. Audit report. Yeah, I believe, Christy, you had requested that we defer. I did. Um, I spoke with um, CFO and also legal counsel and asked that we defer the audit report until the next meeting as chair of the finance committee. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, finance report, we're ready. Uh, finance report. Um, first of all, just a quick update on budget. Just we talked about it briefly at finance. We did get uh, board approval last month at the February board meeting for our preliminary budget that we submitted to Metro on March 5th. Dr. Webb and I, uh, WebEx, met with the mayor's office and uh, Metro finance team. And we presented and then we put the deck in your um, package just so you could see the numbers are similar or the same that you looked at at the meeting. The audience was a little different, so some of the explanations were probably a little bit more elementary uh, just because we're presenting to folks that are not on a hospital board. Uh, so uh, I thought it went well. It was a good hour and a lot of discussion. And of course, as you guys know, there will be at some point a recommendation from the mayor, uh, from the um, mayor's office on a budget number, a support number for the hospital, and we will be back to the board and making those adjustments so that we can have a final approval before the June 30th deadline. So that's the budget update. Uh, for the financial um, results for January, um, pretty busy month. Uh, as most of you remember, we had a snowstorm uh, mid-month. Uh, that sort of knocked out most of our outpatient services, clinic visits, outpatient, you know, elective surgeries and cath lab. Uh, those numbers got knocked down by about four work days. But in the hospital itself, we had 244 admissions, which was a really good month for us. Length of stay was very short at 4.0. That's in line with all seven months thus far. I gave uh, kudos to the, you know, uh, the UM team, Dr. Blackledge's team, uh, to our hospitalists and residents that have helped take care of those patients most expeditiously. So that's really good performance for the hospital. Um, our length of stay has gone from about five days 
two years ago to 4.6 last year and to 4.0 this year. So that's a positive uh, for the hospital and for our patients. Uh, you don't want to stay longer than you need to. Some of the uh, key numbers, though, um, our emergency visits were flat with last month, just about at the budgeted level. We're still about down 10 percent. Uh, from where we were pre-COVID. It's slowly moving up. It's not quite where we were before COVID hit. Emergency admissions were very high at 210. Um, our clinic visits were sub 2,900. As I said, we lost about four full days of clinic visits uh, due to the snowstorm uh, and its aftermath. And then our inpatient, outpatient surgery cases and cath lab were also about 25% below budget. Again, that was really four full days of a lack of access uh, and patients being rescheduled. Um, deliveries have tended to decline down this year. Last year, they were up 15%. Uh, this year, they're down uh, pretty significantly, not just for the month, but for the year to date. Uh, other thing we discussed was case mix in the hospital setting. It's just been a bit lower than we anticipated. It's down about 7% from a year ago. Um, it could be that we're converting less sick patients into inpatient days or inpatient stays, but it's just something that we are looking into to see if it's um, a documentation issue potentially or a coding opportunity or if it really is reflecting a lower acuity of patients in the inpatient setting. Uh, for the financial income statement side of the hospital, uh, because our uh, length of stay was short, even though we hit admissions, our patient days, case mix, length of stay were all lower, and so our inpatient revenue was about 18% behind budget gross. And then our outpatient with lower OBS patients, lower OR cases, and lower clinic visits, we were about 10% uh, behind on that number. So. Gross revenues, 13% uh, or $3.4 million behind budget to start the month. Um, payer mix was favorable. We were able to harvest almost 21% uh, of that gross revenue into net revenue. Uh, it still produced about $4.8 million of net. The budget was 5.2, so a negative variance of about 400,000 there. Um, on our other revenues, um, we talk about it all the time that other revenues uh, float. Sometimes we get a big payment, uh, essential access and dish payments. When they come in, they don't meet any particular um, schedule. And so we had scheduled to receive a big one this month. We did not. And so you have a $1.8 million negative variance there. We did get a significant essential access payment, which helped make up some of that negative variance there. And then we had the uh, support uh, accrual from Metro government of 4.8 million. So total revenue for the month of 11.8 was about 1 million behind budget for the month. Our expenses, with the exception of contract labor, which has bedeviled us for a while, um, were in line. Um, our supply costs and pharmacy costs were actually well below budget. And um, all in, our expenses were about 600000 higher than our budget budgeted number. And so for the month of January, similar to our December, we lost about $750,000. I just remind everyone that for the first five months of the year, we were uh, plus $6 million in terms of uh, income or profit margin. So for the year to date now, through seven full months, we're still at a positive 4.4 million operating margin compared to a budget of supposed to have lost $4 million. So it's positive, but uh, the month of December and January were uh, sort of more traditional than the first five months. So that is our financial report through January. Any questions? You know, deliveries are um, a good source of income for the hospital. Did we have a change in the number of providers that would account for that? You know, I, I don't believe so in uh, Dr. Miller, but I would defer to our own folks in the room. I think we have the same number of providers. I don't think there's been any net change. Um, I can't speak to why delivery numbers go up. 
And, and if you look in the operations report, Dr. Miller, I think you would see we've had months as high as 45 and as low as 20 just in the last seven months. And so I can't speak to it. I think some months just tend to be naturally busier than others, uh, particularly in that service line. All right, uh, any um, comments from the Finance Committee concerning this? I know it was reviewed. Do you have any comments? Sorry, no comments. Okay. Thank you, Bruce Will. Uh, any other uh, questions or comments on this report? If not, we'll entertain a motion to adopt. So moved. Second. All right, it's been moved and properly second. All in favor, vote by sign of aye. 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 All opposed? Ayes have it. It's adopted. All right. Um, Dr. Webb, you're recognized for the CEO's report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and congratulations are in order to our board chair. Uh, for being listed in Nashville's post-2024 In Charge Healthcare Edition. Congratulations to you for that recognition. Uh, the, um, we have uh, additions to our executive team. I, I believe at the last board meeting, I uh, introduced Dr. Fair as our Chief Population Health and Research Officer. And she's here today and uh, also Ms. Jen Balog, who is, has joined us as Chief Development Officer and Executive Director of the Foundation. Ms. Balog, welcome aboard. Uh, and they're both New Yorkers. So. <laughs> uh, the um, Bordeaux Clinic officially opened uh, this week. And so we've been uh, seeing patients over there. We have a slight uh, delay in getting the um, uh, imaging center, which should be opening um, around June, May or June. We did have to uh, hold off until the uh, building was completely um, um, occupied, not occupied, but uh, uh, reviewed by the uh, codes department and um, then apply for the CON following that. So it, it was a subsequent activity. But we will be uh, looking to open our diagnostic center uh, around uh, late May to uh, early June. Um, this week, uh, we will, uh, we've already launched our um, uh, no weight uh, emergency department. And uh, on April 1st, next week, not necessarily April Fool's Day, but uh, we will be uh, promoting uh, through uh, the media the uh, opening of a no-weight ER. So uh, you will be seeing some of that uh, media presentation going on uh, next week. National Doctors' Day is March 30th, and due to that being on uh, a weekend, we're going to host uh, doctors on Thursday, April 4th, from 12 to 1. Uh, you're certainly welcome to attend that. Maybe we can have more than one board member there. Um, as uh, previously mentioned, Nashville General Hospital and its uh, uh, faith-based organization, CHIN, are participating in a number of events uh, until the early summer. We sponsored our kids and attended our kids Soup Sunday on March 3rd. If you had the opportunity to make that, our kids have raised over the last 30 years um, $1.8 million. And that, those funds have gone to uh, counseling for families and children uh, struggling with uh, child sexual, sexual abuse. Our kids is a division of Nashville General Hospital. We also hosted a widow's brunch for the Gamma Phi chapter of Omega Sci Fi fraternity here last weekend, well attended. Um, and this morning, we welcomed the uh, Leadership Middle Tennessee uh, 
cohort group that are in, well, they're actually interviewing to be a member of the 2025 cohort group. So um, that was uh, also well attended. And on a save the date, uh, we're going to be celebrating the 134th year anniversary. Uh, and there will be a community brunch on April 27th. This year's theme is the heart of the community. That's my report. Happy to answer any questions. Yes. Tell me how you accomplish some highlights. You know, some years ago, I had the privilege of visiting a no weight ER and uh, actually in rural Mississippi. Uh, and it's uh, I'm going to let Veronica Elders, who is the chief nursing officer, I could do it. But I wouldn't do justice as well as she will. Thank you. Can go to the mic up to the podium. To the podium. <laughs> it's exciting. Thank you. So the no weight ED is more about a perceived weight when you walk into the emergency department. So typically when you walk in, you meet a registrar who registers you, asks you to sit down while you wait on the triage nurse. We've replaced that with two clinicians who will be there to greet you up front. They will start your process, do a quick reg, and move you through the treatment process immediately. Uh, the staff in the back, it's, we call it pull to full. And so it's more about a perceived weight when you initially walk in the door versus you being asked to sit down. Clinicians are starting your lab testing, getting your orders together, and moving you through to an empty bed immediately. We've done really well. So this week alone, we were at um, our door to bedtime was about 14 minutes. We've gone down to two on yesterday. So we had a two minute time from door to bed yesterday. I think we started like at three, then it was four uh, the day before. So we're getting better. We've also put together an ED um, throughput task force across the hospital. We'll be looking at lab turnaround times, x-ray results. You know, how are we facilitating that care while that patient's here? Uh, and it's the entire organization. Not just the ED. Yeah. Any other questions? And I believe that this, um, it's, you should know that this is not just starting at the opening. Uh, there was a, what, three week, three month? We've period. been working on this now since January, just right. kind of looking at the process, educating staff, uh, doing walkthroughs, uh, getting everything together. And so the marketing will, will start rolling out April 2nd because we needed that time to kind of work out any kinks before we threw it out there to the public. But with the two minute time uh, and the three minutes that I'm seeing, I'm pretty impressed with our team. So the idea is to remove the weight room and basically it becomes a lounge for family members. Uh, so weight implies, weight room implies that you're gonna wait and that's not what we want people doing. What kind of volume are you seeing with these wait times? Right now, so typically our ED visits range from 60 to 80. We were as high as like 84 yesterday, which is big. Because when COVID hit, we were, when I first came here to Nashville General in 2015, we were like at uh, 90 to 100 visits, sometimes crossing over the 100. In COVID, we went down to about 60. We're now back up to about 80. And so as we continue to move forward with this and, and the word gets out, we anticipate that volume to grow. Uh, as it's grown across the um, city. Thank you. Thank you. All right, any, any more questions or comments for Dr. Wells' report? All right. I do want, to, we heard from Dr. Southpaw, but I do want to at least acknowledge uh, Dr. Hildred, who's uh, in the audience with us as well. And thank you for being here. and. Uh, Coming, Dr. Cummins still, good to see you. And Dr. Council Lady Webb, so good to see you. Thank you all for being here as well. Okay, in, in, in lieu of not having the budget uh, and the audit today and some of the things that we, we heard earlier, I'd really like to uh, roll our strategy session to next week, I mean, our next meeting in April uh, to, to address some of the concerns that we heard uh, today and, with, and get some more advice from legal, if that's okay. If everybody's okay with that? Okay. I see everybody's head is nodding. <laughs> so our, our next meeting is, is Thursday, April the 25th. And again, uh, thank you to all of the committees. I'm sorry, go ahead. 
I just had a quick question. As I was reviewing some of the minutes that we've already passed, I noticed that there were some action items that I feel like um, would be helpful for all of us as a committee to be able to follow up with. So I, my ask would be, um, is there a way in the minutes to either at the beginning or at the end have a list with follow-up individuals and potentially a timeline for some of these things? Because I, I just don't want them to be um, passed by. For instance, um, one of the things I noticed that we mentioned is conflict of interest. Uh, we still don't have that yet in writing. Sorry. And um, I'd just like to make sure things like that are moved forward. And um, so, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Needless to say, it goes without saying, don't sit by me. But, uh, it, but I, I feel like those are things that would be important. And I noticed there was a couple other follow-up items as um, exit interviews with uh, some of the doctors. You were going to check on that. So, again, just making sure as we're reading these minutes, who's responsible for what, what the timeline is, and, and the action step is. So thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, would it be out of the question to add, uh, since we now have a development officer, a report from the foundation every month at the board meeting? Sure. Yep. We they used to give us. Uh, we used to have the development officer kind of put together uh, those are uh, good news stories and would would share that that information. And so, yeah, to have them share with us uh, would be helpful. Absolutely, we can add that. And Ms. Lester, we'll, we, will, uh, we will work on making sure we have those added to the minutes. So are we going to have two executive sessions next time? It'll be one. More, more, uh, one. To address which items? So we will, we will uh, have an executive session to address PSA concerns. TSA. PSA. A PSA, okay. And then what, what, uh, what, what about uh, and Dr. S Dr. Southpaw's? Well, that, that's what I consider PSA. Oh. Oh. Okay, all right. I'm not sure what TSA is. But P PSA. 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 <laughs> Let me just remind, when you speak to an executive session, that implicates one called by the attorney to give attorney client advice. You have a statute that permits a closed session outside of the open meeting for the purpose of developing strategic plans and marketing strategies. The purpose within those two dimensions, strategic plans and marketing strategies, is still subject to a legal opinion of whether that's what you are discussing related to that. So I need to caution that a PSA may be part of your strategic plans, may not. We got to go through some legal analysis. So I just don't want that to escape your attention until we have an opportunity for the lawyers to work up a plan to so, make so, sure we don't run afoul of the Open Meetings Act. So, Doc, Dr. Miller, there are some things that we need to discuss, but we want to, the, what our counsel is saying is that we have to make sure that it meets this, the, the statute. Yeah, I, think he, I think what he's saying is that this is either something that would be strategic that we do in an executive session or part of the open meeting. Correct. So it's, it's discussed one way or the other. Was, was there, uh, for today's scheduled closed meeting, was the medical staff bylaws part of that, what we were going to discuss? Yes. And will that be included? In yes. Okay. Mr. Chairman, back here, Dr. Williams. Oh, okay. Am I allowed to speak? Yes. All right. Um, I would just let the board know that the hospital and Meharry have not had a discussion yet. And I don't know if, if we're going to talk about this issue, if we were going to elevate it up to the board level before the two institutions have had a chance to talk amongst themselves. The discussion about the bylaws was in response to a request that the board wanted. And we wanted to share some other things with you. But this, you know, surprise announcement today 
which we have not had a chance to address between the two of us seems to me a little premature to escalate it up to the board members. So I just throw that out there for your consideration. Is there something on the schedule for the two entities to get together so then we could at least as the board know when to follow up or? I would say speaking for only myself, this is part of my frustration is that we did not know this was gonna be brought up. And if I knew that, um, I, I had a meeting with Dr. Southpaw last week. They did not mention that they were gonna bring this up at the board. And if so, I would have asked to give us a chance to discuss it first. So this is part of my frustration in trying to resolve these issues. And I think kicking it up to the board puts you in a very difficult position also. I think that, that part of this also reflects our discussion last week where there seemed to be concern among board members that a lot of the issues between Meharry and Nashville General were not being brought to the board's attention. And, um, and I think that, you know, Dr. Southpaw's presentation today, at least as a start, that outlines some of the issues that we feel we should know about. I uh, would like to just go on record since it's already been made public uh, that this presentation was made today that I respectfully disagree and reject those accusations. Uh, I would also request that the hospital staff or team, the executive team, be allowed to speak with the board members regarding, since we are the hospital that you're representing as board members, we would like to speak with the board before we go into a full challenging session with the accusations and accusers. Yeah, I think we're, we're getting into this as an agenda item and that makes me a little nervous. So to your, to your point, Dr. Miller, as board members have requested to have information about what's happening with the relationship, we will agenda item this at our next meeting. And that will give opportunity for us to, uh, to hear uh, from both parties. And if we, if we, if, if in meeting with our council determined that some of the conversations should be handled and executive strategy session, we'll, we'll, we'll move to do so. Yes. Mr. Chairman, we have a month until the next board meeting. I would urge staff and hopefully our colleagues at Meharry to get together within that month so that we can have some substantive discussion at the next board meeting. A month is not a long time, but it's not a short time. And I think it's an, certainly appropriate if it's a he said, she said that we go back and forth on, we have to start somewhere and we can do that now. Mr. I, Chairman, I agree with you. Mr. Yes. Chairman, I, I, I want to make sure everyone heard what Dr. Webb said. You asked the administration to respond to some of your concerns and questions. We have not had a chance to do that. We would like to do that before we have a meeting where two parties are challenging each other. We think we want to present in response to your request first. And then if after that meeting, you want to have a combined meeting that would be fine. Or if you wanted to ask us to meet with Meharry and then report to you, but we have not had a chance to respond to your original request, which we were prepared to do today. So I, I, I agree with Mr. Lesser. I, I do think that there should be an opportunity for those conversations to take place before our next board meeting. And I, he's urging that that happen, and I support him in that. Can you explain what that means? Because I'm not sure I understand what you're saying. Yeah, so we were presented some information today, and uh, the information we were presented, we cannot respond to, but you all can. You all can have those conversations prior to us meeting again in April. 
And so when we get back together in April, uh, I mean, obviously I would prefer that, that this wouldn't be something that the board would have to deal with. I, I mean, I'm just being very transparent. I would hope that those kind of things would be worked out with each managing team and, and not handled at a board level. And so I think that's what we're requesting. I respectfully request that the board at least hear what the leadership team at the hospital that you serve as a board member of, that you hear our uh, response to those accusations. Yeah, I, I, for one, want to hear the responses, whether, whether it's in an open meeting or a closed meeting. I think they were brought to the board, and so we need to hear the, hear the responses. The Open Meetings Act in no way prohibits board members from having conversation with staff or staff having conversation with the individual board members. If you want to receive the information as a collective body, you'll have to receive it in an open meeting. But there's nothing over the next month that prohibits the leadership of the hospital or whoever they designate to speak with you board members and you individually can give audience to them. That is not an open meeting. I just want to make that clear in case Dr. Webb wishes to inform you of, of issues uh, related to this or uh, Dr. Williams or someone else. So just so you all have a, you have a clear path if that's what you want to do. Doc, Dr. Webb, how would, you, how would you like to respond? I would have liked to respond to the accusations yes. by sharing information in, in a session with the full board of how we have uh, engaged in this overall uh, PSA, as it's referred to, uh, over the years and how those accusations are not accurate. I mean, just basically evidence and information to you to show how we have uh, interacted throughout this process. I've been here now into my 10th year, so I think we at least deserve the opportunity to have that conversation with our board uh, without having other members in the audience. You said without having other members in the audience? I mean other individuals in the audience of that for that discussion a session, and I believe that that should, if we're going to discuss that level of uh, internal information, it should qualify that it would be in a strategy session and not in an open session. Uh, but that information needs to be shared with the board, and I don't think it needs to be done in a form where there's a back and forth. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, as usual, I'm confused. Um, and and thank you council for assisting me in that path um my 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 understanding from what you said is that for the management of the hospital to go ahead and share the response outside of a it would be best to do in an individual presentation to board members is that did I hear that correctly, or am I wrong? That is an acceptable. I'm not going to make a choice between what's best. I'm just saying that's a legal method to okay. do it. All right. If, however, at the open meeting, whenever you all may meet, the chair elects to place on the agenda an item for a presentation from the hospital staff, that's also acceptable. Okay. What may be debatable and is yet to be determined is whether these issues qualify for a closed session under the strategic okay. plans and marketing strategies. Then, I'm not saying I can't find a path there, but I'm not tonight able to give you that opinion yet. But you have two ways to certainly legally provide the information to one another, either individually or at your next meeting have a presentation recognized as an agenda item by the chair of the, who sets the agenda. Is there an opportunity rather than try to fit this into a board meeting to have a special session uh, or a special meeting that is 
uh, an open meeting, but specifically has an agenda that would discuss this subject matter. Um, Again, the special called meeting privilege lies with the board chair. But that is he could possible. It is. It is possible. It feels like that we've did that again. My only experience is the airport authority, but we have had special sessions where a meeting was called. It was an open meetings act where we discussed a specific topic of which we had multiple people come in to that topic through the agenda. And we were able to navigate an issue um, and educate ourselves as a board collectively and have different people come in. And it feels like maybe that is a right avenue rather than try to squeeze it in amongst quality reports and marketing. And we can all get together and focus on this one specific topic. Just a thought. I, I don't think that uh, a one-on-one -on -one with each of us, with Dr. Webb is an acceptable way to do this. I mean, we, we all want to hear the same thing. We all, we want to hear each other's questions. Um, I think board members would, uh, may want to ask questions to Dr. Southpaw, who, you know, we didn't get to ask her any questions during this, this presentation. Um, and somebody's pointed out that, um, you know, there's, we have two parties disagreeing, always potential, potential for legal action since it's a contract. Doesn't that qualify it as a um, closed meeting? Somebody has said that already tonight. One, whether or not there's a contract and whether or not there's a legal dispute for which litigation is likely to occur would be a test I would have to, as an attorney, analyze before I could... And remember, that type of executive session is not where you can ask the lawyer questions, you can't ask questions of other board members, uh, and limited questions even to the staff in that type of a legal advice scenario because it's related to either existing litigation or likely to result in litigation. I don't think that's, that's almost too tight of parameters for what I'm hearing from the audience. Uh, the special called meeting or a regular open meeting among the other agenda items are really the two avenues that would allow full discussion, full presentations, if that's your goal. So I, I think council is saying that there is a way to get there. He, he just need to really review it and make sure it, it meets the smell test of the law. And then we can still go into that strategy so he just don't want to give that opinion at this point and i and i i think that's appropriate i i fully believe we should be able to have these discussions and strategy session and it should meet the mustard of the law uh chair yes i, I, I just wanted to say just as it relates to the psa uh it's been a source of discussion as long as i can remember going back at least eight or nine years and it has been multiple strategic sessions held to discuss different aspects of the PSA. So I'm pretty sure there's a way that it can be placed in a strategic session, just how it's structured. I, I agree with you. And I've been in those same strategic sessions around the PSA with you. So you're absolutely right. I, you know, again, I just wanted to uh, make sure we give council the opportunity to review and make sure that we're in the right parameters. So. Yeah. It would be helpful if we could get a copy of the Meharry's position statement just because it would help in our analysis greatly. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes. So I understand this back and forth about when and how, and I respect, Dr. Webb, your comments about making sure that we understand what the position is of, of management. But at the same time, it seems to me the deeper issue is the lack of communication between Meharry and Nashville General. And that needs to move ahead. There can be, we're just kicking the, kicking the can. I'm sorry? That, that's the bottom line for me, is that we, we need to encourage better communication between the two institutions to resolve these things, not at the board level, but at the organization level. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Dr. Wittenberg. I agree 100%. My point is 
you have not given your administrative team, who you have a fiduciary responsibility to, to respond to you before you bring in an outside party. That's all we're saying. We're not, we, we believe there should be a discussion. We believe that's the root of the issue. We just want to have an opportunity to inform you as your leadership, as you requested, as we were prepared to do tonight, and rather than lump all that into one meeting. That's, that's the distinction. Why should that preclude you all going ahead and starting oh, to talk to not, each other? It doesn't have to. Doesn't that, have to. That, that's what I would hope that we would hear at the next board meeting, that those discussions have at least begun. We can do that, but we would still like to have an audience Understood. with our board. Understood and, and, and appreciate it. I think that's the only point that's being made. Um, we've always been open to working together. Uh, it might not sound like it after what you heard tonight, but I can assure you there are a number of activities and resources being shared and displayed that help to fulfill the, uh, the role of the index uh, teaching hospital. Uh, again, we're just asking that our board give us that opportunity. So we have to walk and chew gum at the same time. All right, any other discussion around this? Uh, I, I will, um, after discussion with legal, I'll, I'll, we'll make a decision on, on what we add to the agenda or if we have a special called meeting to address this. So we'll, I'll make a decision on that after some discussions with legal uh, and moving forward. And Dr. Webb and to, to, to our, our executive team, you know, I, I don't want you all to get the feeling that you're, you're, you're not being supported or that uh, in any way this, this board is, is not interested in also hearing, you know, um, your perspective because that's, 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 that's certainly not true. I think what uh, most of the members are, are, are simply saying is that we simply want to make sure that the quality of care that the patients receive here is not hindered by, by any of the other outside noise. And so if I was considering uh, becoming a new patient in Nashville General and I was watching this particular board meeting, I would be a little concerned, right? Maybe not overly concerned, but I would be at least a little concerned that, um, that, that if things are not healthy in terms of relate work relationships and maybe the quality of care could suffer. So again, I think those are conversations that we can have and I would be happy to get with our, with our legal counsel and determine uh, the best course of action in terms of an agenda item at the next meeting, if we have a separate meeting and, um, and, and hear perspectives in terms of so the board can, as we make our decisions and, and, and contemplate on things that we have to vote on, we'll have a, um, we have a full array of information. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm cautious to, uh, I really want to go down this trail because again, this is not an agenda item tonight. And so I, you know, I don't want us to, to uh, look like we're violating the sunshine in terms of have, having this discussion. <laughs> all right, now I'm finna go, go to church on y'all. If all hearts and minds are clear. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I'll uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. Been moved and properly second. All in favor, vote by a sign of aye. All opposed, ayes have it. Thank you. If any board this has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.